Welcome to LSEIQ, a podcast from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where we ask leading social scientists and other experts to answer an intelligent question about economics, politics or society. Earlier this year, the independent watchdog organisation Freedom House published Freedom in the World 2018, its annual study assessing the condition of political rights and civil liberties around the globe. The report cautioned that, in 2017, democracy had faced its most serious crisis in decades, as its basic tenets came under attack around the world. These include guarantees of free and fair elections, the rights of minorities, freedom of the press and the rule of law. 71 countries were found to have suffered net declines in political rights and civil liberties, with only 35 registering gains. This, the report marked, was the 12th consecutive year of decline in global freedom, with democratically elected governments in a number of countries including Hungary, Poland and the United States appearing to be moving further toward authoritarianism, might next year see an even bigger drop in freedom around the world. In this episode, Jess Winterstein asks, why is democracy declining? Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. On 30th of March 1961, future American President Ronald Reagan addressed the annual meeting of the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. His warning, that freedom if unprotected could be lost within a generation, still stands today as a powerful reminder that the political landscapes we all live within are not set in stone but could change at any time. Nearly 60 years on, with democracy on the decline around the world since 2006, his warning seems more prescient than ever. Dr Brian Klass is a Fellow in Comparative Politics at LSE and author of The Despot's Accomplice, How the West is Aiding and Abetting the Decline of Democracy. I asked him what might be behind this global shift. I think there's two things to think about. One is that there's the decline of democracy and the challenge of democracy in the West in already democratic states, which are engaged in what's called democratic backsliding, where basically democratic norms are being eroded. And then there's also the countries in the rest of the world that already were quasi-democratic and are sliding towards authoritarianism. The first one is the places uh, in the West. So... I think there's a crisis of democracy that's been brewing for a long time for economic reasons that has been exacerbated by cultural reasons. So um, since the 1980s, wage stagnation for working class people has become part of economic life uh, in the West, and that used to not be the case. So if you look at median voters, for example, in the United States, their quality of life doubled about every 25 years. And that ended starting in 1980, where there's only been marginal gains. At the same time, there's huge uh, increases in inequality. That makes a lot of people really angry at the system, and the system is democracy. So there's a lot of people doubting the system, and that means doubting democratic norms and democratic procedures. Uh, At the same time, you have this perfect storm in the West because there's a lot of people who blame those failures on cultural and demographic change. So influx of immigrants, um, changes to the demographic makeup of the country. Obviously, the U.S. is becoming less white. there are people, I mean, I think it's you know, uh, something we have to acknowledge, there are people who really are upset about that. Um, obviously, I disagree with that interpretation of the world, but there are a lot of people who view this as a failure of democracy to protect the cultural character of the societies they live in, right? And so the combination of, I think, those two factors is really powerful in causing people to be upset at the system, and that's coming at the same time that globalization is decimating manufacturing in rural parts of Western Europe and the United States. So all of a sudden you have these people who are just feeling failed by the system, left behind by the system, looking for something else, and the something else might be a strong man who promises uh, quick solutions or in, for example, Trump's words, the I alone can fix it candidate, which is a, a phrase he used. While the term democracy, which means rule by the people, has been around since the time of the ancient Greeks, there is debate over which country today has the longest continuing functioning democracy. Certainly one of the oldest modern democracies, however, is America, which receives specific mention in the Freedom House report as having recently retreated from its traditional role as both a champion and an exemplar of democracy amid an accelerating decline in American political rights and civil liberties. Brian's latest book is titled The Despot's Apprentice, Donald Trump's Attack on Democracy, 
I asked him in what ways the President of the United States could be said to be undermining his country's democratic institutions. The reason I call him a despot's apprentice is because I think it's hyperbole and alarmist to say he's actually a despot or a dictator. It's, he's obviously not. He's existing in a democratic context. That being said, what determines whether somebody becomes a despot or a dictator is an interaction between the person and the system. right? And the person, Donald Trump, would love to be a despot. I'm convinced of this clearly. that. He, he, he lashes out at anything that challenges his authority, and he admires strongmen. So I think there's, a clear there's clear evidence that his personality is despotic. He's being constrained by the system. That doesn't mean that we should take uh, any less seriously the, the risks that come with a person in that, power, in that you know, capacity as the President of the United States who has authoritarian tendencies. And specifically, those tendencies are very clear. There is obviously the uh, lies about his cult of personality, which the Washington Post documented more than 2,000 lies or misleading statements in one year, which is unprecedented in American politics. There is the constant attacks on the press. Um, which are having a negative effect on public opinion towards the value of a free press in, in a given society. There's also the ethics violations, right? I mean, Trump's family business is completely uh, in tune with the government's operations. There's no real separation between the two, which means there is a very easy way to bribe the president. Um, by benefiting his business and creates massive conflicts of interest. And then you have the politicization of rule of law. Trump has called to jail Hillary Clinton and one of her aides, Huma Abedin, despite the fact that there is uh, a consensus among law enforcement that no crimes were committed. Uh, you don't see that in democratic states where you call to jail political opponents. He's pardoned political allies. And then he's also attacking an independent investigation routinely by calling it a witch hunt and, and basically saying that it's, you know, it should not be able to continue its work. Um, that's the very basis of rule of law is that there's independence to these investigations. So, you know, I think that that aspect is really dangerous because it's hard to walk back, right? Once once a third or a, or a half of the country believes that law enforcement is political, it doesn't just go away when the person who says that leaves office. It poisons the, the minds of people in a democracy. Um, and then you also have, you know, politicization uh, of basic institutions and government. And then finally, the most obvious one probably is the scapegoating of minorities, um, you know, where Trump is constantly basically blaming every ill in American society on Mexicans, migrants, Muslims, and black athletes, um, which is extremely common in virtually every authoritarian regime on the planet. So I, I think the debate is now in the realm of how much damage is he doing to democracy and how long will, those dam that, will that damage last, as opposed to does he have authoritarian tendencies. Whether he'll amount to anything in chipping away at democracy, I, I'm very worried about this and I think he will, um, but other people are more optimistic about the robustness uh, of American institutions. Dr. Jonathan Hopkin is Associate Professor of Comparative Politics at LSE and one of those with more optimism, although we should not underestimate, he cautions, the impact that current events in America might have on democracy worldwide. You know, the big test I think we're probably seeing is the United States under Trump. Trump is clearly an iconoclast in terms of, you know, democratic conventions in the U.S. political system. Can the system survive? Are the countervailing powers which are supposed to protect uh, American democracy able to do their job? So the U.S. political system is kind of uniquely designed around restraining the power of the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature by setting them against each other and allowing each of these institutions to control and, and, and uh, constrain the other. So we're seeing a big test of that right now with Trump. Trump clearly in many ways is very, you know, feels um, annoyed and irritated by the constraints of democratic procedures. On the other hand, you know, the US political system is a very highly entrenched and institutionalized one, which would lead you to expect that the institutions will be able to to survive whatever threat he, he poses to them. I mean, we will see, but I'm relatively optimistic that American democracy is not going to collapse under Trump. Jonathan is also co-director of Democratic Audit, an independent research unit based at LSE, which audited UK democracy in 2017. He explains more. What we try to do is look through a range of different criteria uh, for democracy and see how the UK is performing. So that implies looking at a series of possible measures of how democratic a political system is and whether the UK is actually meeting the you know, minimum standards of a, of a democratic system. And is it? Well, uh, in some respects, yes, and in other respects, no. I mean, the 
the UK has many uh, many of these problems as a political system, we have a bit of an odd democracy in a number of ways. So part of what we've been trying to do over the last few years with the audit is to make it a little bit more couched in more of a comparative perspective and see how the UK compares to other similar countries. Uh, we have a bit of a idiosyncratic uh, history as a democracy. Uh, we don't have a written constitution, unlike the vast majority of other democratic systems, for example, which means that some of the rules of the game are a little unclear and leave scope for politicians and other political actors sometimes to stretch uh, uh, the possibilities of the system in ways which could be seen as undemocratic. It seems when it comes to democracy, we should remember that political institutions differ and there is no one approach that suits all. But why are we seeing a global turn against a system that should, in theory at least, benefit the people the most? One issue that has cast a shadow over electoral decisions in a number of countries is the claim that the Russian government has deliberately sought to negatively influence the outcome of Western elections, including the UK's Brexit referendum and the United States presidency. Tamila Lankana is Professor of International Relations and lead of the Political Mobilisation and Democracy Project at LSE, which focuses on the dynamics of popular protests in Russia and Eurasia. She explains more. So Russian intervention in, 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 in Western elections, in some ways what Russia is doing abroad has been tried and tested in its own domestic political landscape. And we've seen that over and over again. For instance, Russia, and I've analyzed uh, the ways in which Russian media have covered anti-regime protests as well as nationalist protests occurring within Russia. And I uh, uncovered some interesting trends in terms of the semantics, the, the, the usage of words that the media, the state-controlled media uh, employ, uh, that, that the, the words that the media use to describe anti-regime protests. And they're portrayed in very negative ways, in ways that kind of de delegitimize the agenda of the protesters, in ways that portray them as kind of inherently destabilizing and bad for the country and for the stability and integrity of the country. So what we're observing is that Russia has kind of been very well trained in applying certain techniques of manipulation of public opinion in its own domestic environment and it is now doing that in in western context but the ultimate goal is not necessarily to uh, promote authoritarianism but it is about destabilizing the, the political systems um, of Western democracies, perhaps delegitimizing democracy. And the way Russia is doing it, in some ways it's very clever, because Russia is kind of pushing a lot of different buttons when it comes to popular sentiment in Western democracies. And to some, it might appear quite contradictory. For instance, Russia has fan clubs among the uh, black power movement as well as anti-immigration movements in, 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 in Western context. So in other words, they're supporting different groups that they believe, whatever their ideologies are, but they believe that these groups might be somehow destabilizing of Western democracies. And, and so the ultimate goal is perhaps to destabilize the European Union, influence the Brexit vote, again, with the aim of kind of sowing doubt about the legitimacy of these Western established institutions. And unfortunately, I would argue that it's also the case that Russia is kind of exploiting sentiments that are already there. So it's not just engineering these sentiments, it's very cleverly kind of pushing the buttons of sentiments that are already present. So there are inherent problems in Western democracies themselves that that Russia is kind of very cleverly, very strategically ca capitalizing upon in its media uh, narratives and manipulation. Perhaps we shouldn't be so quick to blame external influences for our decisions. Here's Tamila explaining how the rhetoric published through the UK's media at the time of the Brexit referendum may also have played a part. I think generally what Russia is also exploiting is the overall popular disillusionment with Western institutions and the media is one of those institutions. Um, and for instance, I've observed how 
the Brexit debates were covered in different outlets, outlets established media channels like the Financial Times and, and, and the Times of London. And they've, oh, they're very, they were very polarized and, and very partisan and in some ways quite manipulative and crude in the way they were taking a side in the debate. And I'm talking about media that were taking you know, the, the polar opposite sides. And so there is a sense among the general public that the media, not whichever uh, shade of opinion, they're not necessarily, um, they're not necessarily reflecting or, or, or public opinion or presenting events in a kind of unbiased and objective way. So there is a disillusionment with that. And that kind of leads people to withdraw into alternative new forms of new media, uh, different online chat forums, political discussion forums, of course, uh, Twitter and other kinds of communication, which have a, an empowering effect on the people as they kind of navigate their way through what they perceive to be quite a manipulated media environment. And um, unfortunately, the downside of that is that countries like Russia have become very adept at manipulating um, and influencing these alternative channels as well. And we know from uh, the, the scandals with uh, Russia's use of Facebook to kind of uh, project certain opinions and create certain kind of constituencies for particular opinions during the US presidential election. That is quite controversial. So that is an example of how we should not perceive these, um, these alternative media, um, as some scholar has, has termed the net delusion. We should not delude ourselves uh, about the kind of socially empowering and progressive and democratizing potential of the web, the net. Even without Russian influence, our growing use of the web, and in particular social media, has almost inevitably changed political discourse, posing challenges that are still being grappled with today. How can we identify what is fake news amongst all the other information shared online, and what is the impact of the ease with which we can now simply turn off opinions that differ from our own? I asked Jonathan how advances in technology might be changing democracy. Yeah, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time wondering about this. Um, <laughs> Clearly, there's an extent to which uh, things like Twitter in particular provide access to sometimes very, very good political analysis to a broad audience. So in particular, if we think of certain experts, academic specialists, um, and other people who have useful knowledge on, on political and other issues, they can broadcast their thoughts to a very wide audience and there is no restrictions on access to, to that, provided you know where to look for your information. So in that respect, uh, I think uh, there's been a huge expansion in access to really good quality political knowledge and insight. The problem is at the same time, of course, we end up uh, talking to ourselves quite a lot. So on Twitter, I tend to follow people who have very, very similar uh, political views to mine uh, almost inevitably, whilst people with political views quite different to mine will probably tend not to listen to the things I have to say. So there is an extent to which we can see, you know, kind of tribalism re-emerging in politics. The big question is, is that down to social media or is it because of other factors such as, you know, several years of economic stagnation, you know, the fears people have about globalization and cultural change and so on. The idea that we might be our own worst enemies when it comes to the information we consume is echoed by Brian. I think with social media and with traditional media, one of the problems, again, that lays with individual citizens is human nature is, you know, for good or ill, we like people who agree with us. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just something you, you know, a lot of people recognize this in themselves. You know, if you're at a dinner party and people are constantly disagreeing with you, it starts to get irritating. Now, what that means in our media consumption choices is, Social media is very often a partisan echo chamber for almost everybody on the left and the right. And then the choices of which media you consume when you're either buying a newspaper or you know, uh, listening to radio or, or television media, you're gonna pick the stuff that already confirms your existing biases. Now, I think the problem is because of the lack of objectivity in some of these reports, people are getting a really warped view of what's actually happening. This sort of partisan tribalism where we 
tend to believe the tr that something is true if the person that we like says it um, is so toxic for democracy. And it's where I think that realm of, of media is really, really accelerating polarization. And it's again where because of the way that Trump uh, weaponizes this polarization in ways that I think are quite toxic for democracy, um, it's going to be really hard to undo the damage. And is there anything that um, you'd like to see the government or social media firms or even just individuals sort of do to kind of mitigate some of the um, issues you've just raised? I think there's a few things that need to happen. One is that there is a, a demand on citizens to actually verify information more. Um, and I think we tend to think, you know, this is where I blame citizens a bit, uh, we tend to think about democracy as a thing that we do every four or five years. And I think that that's a, a really unfortunate view of what democracy is. It's supposed to be a daily duty of citizens, and that involves making sure that the information, not only that you're informed, but that you're informed with accurate information. Digital technology might have its faults, but we shouldn't just blame the messenger. What about the message? As inequality has risen and the gap between the rich and poor widened, the idea of a malevolent elite pulling the strings has grown, allowing leaders like Donald Trump to stir up discontent and anger amongst the electorate against those perceived to have the power. The idea of democracy is that the system serves the many, not the few, but Jonathan Hopkins cautions against viewing this as a black and white issue. There's all kinds of uh, money from overseas involved in British politics. Some of it has done a lot of good for democratic debate all around the world, and I don't see anything, so we can't simply make a blanket judgment that foreign money is always bad. Um, but I think money in politics more broadly is an issue, and I think it doesn't stop at foreign money. We need to think about what motives people have for putting money into politics, and we need the maximum transparency, which, and for instance, in the Brexit referendum, appears that there were a lot, there's a lot of sharp practice on the way funders were getting around the rules on limits to spending of particular campaigns and so on. Jonathan teaches a capitalism and democracy course at LSE, which examines the uneasy interaction between these two concepts that appear so entwined in Western societies. I asked him if, despite this closeness, capitalism might be at least partly responsible for democracy's decline. Yeah, well, I think ever since the end of the Cold War, um, we've had this period which is kind of, I think, more or less ending now, but this period of possibly excessive optimism for the future of kind of liberal, free market, democratic systems, which were seen as being, you know, the new world order, George Bush Sr. called it in, in the early 90s. Um, and for all, there are lots of good reasons why um, the market system and liberal democratic institutions uh, should be supported at the same time imagining that you can resolve everything uh, through free markets and democratic elections is naive in the extreme especially since these two uh, systems in many ways are in competition so it's particularly because free market systems generate a lot of inequality of, of uh, economic resources whilst political democracy is supposed to rest on political equality and people having equal access to, to political power and equal say in political decisions. So it's, it's clear that from the moment you have an unequal economic uh, distribution, then you're also going to have inequalities creeping into political decision making. And that links back nicely to what we were just talking about. People with a lot of money have disproportionate influence over political decision making. And that's, you know, on, on most readings of democracy, a violation of this basic principle of, of equality. And um, I mean, the inequality seems to be growing um, globally. So do you see that, um, it is, do, you, do you think while that ha continues to happen, democracy is going to continue to decline? Well, there's a lot of debate about this in, in political science at the moment. So one reading is that uh, inequality begets, uh, economic inequality begets political inequality, and that in turn uh, exacerbates the original problem of economic inequality. So there's been a lot of work, especially in the United States, from various scholars looking at the ways in which the wealthy have disproportionate influence in American politics and the ways in which they tend to use that, for the most part, to uh, enhance their own economic power. Um, on the other hand, um, democracy does have its own kind of safety valves, because it's true that rich people can finance political campaigns to persuade the rest of us to vote in a particular way, but in the end, they can always uh, get their point across. So I think it's fair to say that in the EU referendum in Britain, 
um, the majority of uh, you know the sort of business uh, spokespeople were sort of advocating remain in the EU, and and yet the population voted against that. So um, having money and influence doesn't always buy you political decisions. The relationship between capitalism and democracy is clearly complicated, but after years of wage stagnation and austerity policies in many countries, it isn't hard to understand why some at least are turning against the political system they feel is driving the economic disparity. What responsibility do the institutions have for this growing disillusionment in them? Jonathan Hopkin. I think one of the reasons why we're in the mess we are at the moment with especially sort of uh, the growth, especially of sort of hard right wing uh, uh, political movements in, in many countries is because democratic institutions weren't paying enough attention to people. Um, I mean the European Union, for all I'm broadly an advocate of membership of the European Union, but it's true that in many ways it's tended to remove decisions from public view, it's tended to appear to uh, um, create a great distance between those making big decisions about our futures and actual democratic uh, voting and accountability. And so I think recent trends, obviously the Brexit vote here, but also the Trump vote and votes for Marine Le Pen and other right-wing populists in Europe, tell us that you know democracy needs to be protected by responding to what people want and need and, and, and not protecting democratic institutions from popular pre pressure, which is what sometimes has been happening. According to Tamila Lankana, this discontent with the system may not be so dissimilar to that felt by people living under authoritarian regime. So obviously in Russia, with the electoral landscape heavily manipulated, increasingly so, uh, in what some scholars have called metastasized electoral fraud. In other words, over the years, the fraud, the propensity of different regions of Russia, different precincts to perpetrate electoral fraud has become greater and greater. So inevitably, more and more people feel that they're completely disempowered. The ballot box is, is, is kind of meaningless because their vote doesn't really count for much in this kind of elect, elect, manipulated uh, context. Therefore, people take to the streets. And I have to say, to a certain extent, this is the we're observing there's of course a difference of degree but in substantively a similar kind of processes of disillusionment with electoral politics uh, we, we observe in Europe and other Western contexts as well so and that's why we see more and more people to the taking to the streets and protesting as a way of kind of channeling their grievances and influencing or perhaps even toppling policymakers unfortunately there is a danger also of assuming that protests are inherently democratic. We know, for instance, that in the 2011-2012 protests, anti-Putin, anti-regime protests in Russia, democratic forces and democratic groups marched side by side with kind of ultra-nationalist right-wing forces um, in the form of a negative coalition. In other words, a coalition of people who coalesce around kind of dislike for a particular regime, but they don't necessarily have a carry a positive pro-democracy message, at least not all of them. So there is a danger there as well with, with street forms of activism and assuming that it is necessarily um, conducive to kind of d democracy eventually taking hold. And unfortunately, we are seeing democratic backsliding uh, or, or authoritarian and creeping authoritarianism in a lot of different contexts globally. It seems our democratic institutions must at least shoulder some of the blame in the decline of trust among their electorate. But democracy is, at its centre, about its citizens. What about the responsibility of people living in democratic countries to engage with the system? For decades, a pattern of voter apathy has emerged in the UK and US while a study referenced in The Despot's Apprentice by Brian Klass found one in three Americans no longer saw it as essential to live in a democracy. I asked Brian if perhaps one of the issues was that people in democratic societies had simply become too complacent. 
Yeah, so this is a really difficult question, but a super important one. So you're referring to a research that's done by a guy named Yasha Monk, who's a lecturer at Harvard. And what he shows basically is that older generations view democracy as essential to the tune of 70, 80 percent in most Western societies, whereas 30 to 40 percent of younger people view democracy as essential. And I think this is a part of historical amnesia, where you know people who didn't grow up combating fascism and, and totalitarian rule uh, you know, sort of see democracy as a nice benefit, but not uh, an essential component of our societies. It's a, it's a point that I often try to make to people because I have seen, uh, I mean, I've done a lot of field work in authoritarian societies and it's really grim, right? And so when you see somebody who's justifiably angry, say in Sunderland in the UK or in, you know, rural West Virginia in the US, it's, it's a hard sell politically to say to someone, your situation is bad, it could be worse. Right? That's not exactly the hopeful message that you know, elicits democratic support and votes and campaign prom you know, pledges and all these things. But it's the reality. I mean, you know, th things could be much worse if the core of democracy were, were undermined in Western societies. And so I think it's just important to point out that the, the comparisons we should be really looking at are what would it look like to have a genuinely authoritarian society? And it would stifle innovation. It would stifle creativity. It would cause huge social dislocation that would cause violence there would be immense poverty. I mean, there, there, there are so many things associated with authoritarian rule that people don't think about, and they just sort of have a dichotomy in their mind between democratic politics that they think is not serving them versus the authoritarian strongman that they think will always serve their own interests, and history has proven that that does not exist. I wondered if this was something that could also be said for the UK, which has seen increasing rhetoric from some politicians and press citing the will of the people and criticizing those who might have differing views on what might be best for the country as traitors. I asked Jonathan if trust in the system might simply become too eroded for democracy to survive. Well, um, I mean, some people are arguing that that is what, what's happening, yes, though uh, there's been pushback on, on, on that analysis, so it's not entirely clear. Uh, and also we've seen the rise of sort of populist political movements, some of which have dubious democratic credentials. So all of that seems to point in the direction of concern for the future of democracy. On the other hand, it's also true that um, there has been a bit of a revival of political participation in the recent period. If we look at Britain in particular, turnout in elections is now going up. Party membership is also going up after a long period of decline for both of those indicators. So. Although you may find, you know, people on, on the centre and right would probably be worried that Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party now has half a million members and 40% of the vote, but from the point of view of democratic participation, it's certainly a reflection of people being brought in uh, back, back into political um, activity who before were perhaps alienated. And you could also make the same claims for the Brexit movement, on, which is largely on the right, which has sort of brought some... Um, groups of left behind, if you like, voters who felt also very alienated from the political system, dragged them back into the political arena. So the Brexit referendum was a very, very high turnout event, much higher turnout than most people expected, which is part of the reason why the forecasters got it wrong. People are complex, so perhaps it isn't surprising that there are a number of complex reasons why democratic systems are coming under pressure in the West. But why has democracy stalled elsewhere? I asked Brian what happened to the Western idea of exporting democracy around the world. For a very long time there has been a two-faced relationship the West has had with supporting democracy abroad, um, where you have sort of lip service to human rights and democracy, but at the same time, you know, the US and Britain have very close relationships with Saudi Arabia. Um, what's happened over the last two years, I would say, is that Basically, the West has turned inward, uh, and that increases the, the power that and the leverage that authoritarian forces like China and Russia have to bear on the rest of the world. And so as the U.S. is, you know, turned towards an America first foreign policy that doesn't see itself as shouldering the burdens of a global leader, and you have the EU turning inward to deal with Brexit and far-right populism, democratic backsliding in Eastern Europe, there's less latitude for basically the forces of democracy to engage in the rest of the world and that ultimately is a benefit to China and Russia and that's where that balance of power I think is making a serious difference um, in places that we don't think about all the time say in sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia 
where there are now fewer costs to engaging in authoritarian behavior. I think there's a lot of things going on at the same time that are all manifesting themselves in this perfect storm against democracy both in the West and the rest of the world. Russia and China may both be becoming more powerful in the new world order, but as Tamilla explains, just as democratic systems differ globally, so do those in authoritarian countries. In the Russian case, a lot of it is about media manipulation in combination of, with repression, um, as well as in China as well, you have the media and repression. But China and Russia are also differ in that respect because I've used the term um, in comparing these two countries as developmental autocracy, that is China, versus a predatory autocracy, that would be Russia. In other words, China, in addition to kind of suppressing political opposition and harassing, intimidating political opponents and manipulating the media, is also pursuing a lot of development that ultimately has very strong implications from the point of view of those kind of private concerns of ordinary people and their well-being. People in, in China are benefiting from road infrastructure, rail development, etc., etc in a way that is different from Russia, where, whereby in Russia, a small elite that is essentially predatory in, and extractive in nature is extracting states' resources, plundering them, and there is very little development infrastructure or other, very little investment into public services, healthcare, etc. So ultimately, from my perspective, China is, is a much more resilient autocracy than is Russia. So Russia uh, might have far greater levels of instability uh, than would China because it is not investing into kind of these public goods. And uh, ultimately, whether that will lead to democracy or not, it's another question. It could just lead to kind of uh, instability or even civil conflict. Um, but of course, my hope is that there will be a, um, kind of democratic future, but unfortunately we have to be realistic given the, the history and the kind of uh, authoritarian context we are looking at now. Will Freedom House's 2018 report revealed that the world has continued its slide away from democratic principles for a 13th year. With today's economic climate, divisive leaders like Trump in power, and a growing polarization between those with differing views, perhaps it will. But what of democracy's long-term future? Here's Brian ending on a note of optimism, but also with a reminder that if any democratic society is to work, we must all play our part. In the long run, I think the West has democratic values at its core. And I think in other societies, most people believe in the idea that they should have a say in how they're governed. I think that's the winning argument that Trump's, uh, sorry about the pun, but Trump's every other you know, argument about authoritarianism and democracy is most people do believe that they should not be ruled without any say. And that's where over the long run, I think there will be a continued groundswell pushing for democracy, and that demand for it may end up being the thing that tips it back towards it. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of really powerful forces that are stopping that from happening, and, uh, and they got a major boost in the last two years in foreign policy terms. So you get tired of being the person who says, it's gonna get worse before it gets better, but I think that's basically where we're at um, in less citizens take advantage of the democratic freedoms and opportunities they have to shape a different world, and they engage in ways that ensure that the West becomes a force for democracy in its own societies and abroad. And that's what uh, that glimmer of hope that I'm still clinging on to, to be, to be an optimist. So all those people that say there's no point voting. They're completely they're wrong. Completely wrong. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, imagine, imagine, if you imagine a world in which there is, instead of 36% turnout, as there was in the last midterms, 95% turnout, and, and, and the Republicans lose in a landslide. Republicans, not because of partisan reasons, but because they're enabling Trump, uh, lose in a massive landslide. You know, the most historic defeat in, in all of U.S. history, that'll destroy Trumpism. Authoritarian populism will not only be dead in the United States, but it'll be a major warning call to the rest of the world, in, 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 the, in the Western world particularly, that embracing this strategy invites a backlash. Now, that's not going to happen, unfortunately. There's not gonna be 95% turnout. But you know, if everybody who cares about this tries to register 10 people and convince them to vote, all of a sudden you have knock-on effects. We have this immense democratic privilege in Western societies. It's up to us if we're up unhappy about the direction of our countries, there is an avenue to change. Now there's systemic and structural problems in getting exactly what we want you know, easily, but you can get what you want. I mean, if, there's, if there is 95% turnout in the U.S. elections in, in 2018, I guarantee you the system will change. 
um, it's about bridging the gap from 36 to 95. And, and I think even if we get close to you know, 60 or 70, it will be a, an absolute earthquake of political change. This episode of LSEIQ was brought to you by Natalie Abbott, Shay Forbes-Taylor, James Rutte, Tom Williams and Jess Winterstein. It was based in part on the following research. Post-Truth Politics, Bullshit and Bad Ideas, Deficit Fetishism in the UK by Jonathan Hopkin and Ben Rosamond. More on democratic audit, including the 2017 Audit of UK Democracy, can be found at democraticaudit.com. The Despot's Accomplice, How the West is Aiding and Abetting the Decline of Democracy, and The Despot's Apprentice, Donald Trump's Attack on Democracy, by Brian Klass. Russian Spring, or Spring Betrayal, The Media as a Mirror of Putin's Evolving Strategy in Ukraine, by Tamila Lankana and Koei Watanabe. For more on popular mobilisation and democracy, please see popularmobilisation.net. For more episodes of this podcast, and to subscribe on iTunes and SoundCloud, please visit lsc.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSC IQ in your favourite podcast app. Join us next time when we ask, are we seeing a new gender equality revolution? <laughs>